John. Um, uh, John is the res uh, resource manager at um, Cal Energy, and he's also our uh, president of Geothermal Rising. Uh, John has been on the board for five years. So just hand straight over to John. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. It's good to be here, right? I, first time in two years I've tied a tie. How did it go? <laughs> all right <laughs> well and welcome as well we've got people streaming so thank you for your patience we're going to run into these issues throughout the whole conference um i think by the end of it we might have it perfected and we'll forget everything until next year so <laughs> thank you and and everybody online thank you as well uh we wish you could be here but absolutely understand and we're glad to be doing this um as that you know i do have to cover some housekeeping um we are running a large event here and COVID is still a thing, unfortunately. Um, we've all experienced it in many different ways. But as part of that, please wear your masks. You know, it, I, I'm, I'm up here speaking, but as soon as I, I um, step down, I'm going to. I'm not a fan of them because I just don't like to breathe my own air all the time. However, it's a respect thing, even if, however you sit, sit and feel on mass, um, someone else may feel uncomfortable if you don't have one on. So, so please, please do your part. With respect is also safety. We're at a large event. Um, I make sure that everybody else is safe. However you see that, it's not just COVID. Um, I help run a drilling, drilling operation most of the year. Safety is a big thing. You know, we've, we've got power plants. We all know about safety. So, so that applies here just the same. And, and finally, within that is, is inclusion. Make sure that everybody here is feeling welcome. Part of the team feels comfortable. Um, let's do our, all our own part. And, and it's, um, I think it's even more highlighted with the mass and everything else. But um, yeah, just welcome everyone. Thank you. So... So with that, uh, I guess, what other housekeeping items? Yes, um, thank you to all of our sponsors that made this possible, as well as yourselves. Um, I especially want to highlight our diamond sponsors. That's Ormat, Ever, and Kenai Drilling. So thank you to them. I'm, another round of applause here. <laughs> um, other reminders, please spend some time and visit, visit the exhibit hall. It is professional, great. We've got some wonderful sponsors, organizations that want to share what they're doing with you. And, and it's a great chance to learn. Um, the same thing, Monday night, we've got a mixer. Uh, traditionally, the mixer was not included in your registration. It is now. So please make sure to join. It's going to be a really fun event. Uh, looking forward to seeing you there. Also, well, I don't have to cover that one. It says, please be patient. It's a hybrid meeting. I think we've understood that very well. <laughs> um, and finally, we are on Zoom. So, so those of us who couldn't be here uh, in person, we aren't taking questions during this panel session, but please feel free to note them, send us an email, send us a note, and we'll address them informally afterwards. And same goes for the group here. So that's housekeeping out of the way. We've got a bright future, especially here in the Western US. Um, on June 30th, the California Public Utilities Commission instituted, instituted, um, initiated a decision of which there were 11.5 gigawatts of renewable energy that were mandated to be procured over different series of time. What I'm most excited about is a subset of that order that requires the investor owned utilities of California as well as the community choice aggregators to procure a thousand new megawatts of geothermal between now and 2026 with an extension for an extra two years if need be. So what that says to me is in the next five to seven years, all of us in this room, all of us online and, and not just in the Western US but globally as a community, we're gonna be building the next generation of geothermal to feed and serve the California grid. And that is tremendous. We haven't seen an opportunity like this in over 30 years. You know, the power plants I work at, at Cal Energy, not all of them are 30 years old, but they're in that range. And it came from the standard offer four contracts is what really built a lot of Cal California's geothermal and the Western US is geothermal. We've got that opportunity again to, to um, create the next generation's geothermal. And it's, it's mon monumentous. Um, I, I, I can't be more excited. I'm up to my neck or ears or something else with, 
with work trying to trying to pursue that for our own or, um, for my own company, but within the organization, everyone I've talked to here is busy. We're excited, and this is just the just the beginning. So, looking forward to a very bright future with it. Um, and the amazing thing is, is that's where it starts. That that geothermal, it's not defined as geothermal. I will clarify that that biomass can participate in that same order. We're not expecting as much biomass. However, the order does not include the municipalities nor the state of California who are, who've traditionally been more aggressive with their renewable energy goals. So what we're looking here is a floor to an amazing new market and a lot of new geothermal coming online that's gonna support uh, California. And that's just California. I, that's, that's where I reside and we're, this is where the conference is. But I do recognize we have global opportunities out there that are going to um, be just as amazing. So, so it's, it's, a, it's a great time, uh, really excited. And I'm excited that we're all here back again and we've adapted and we're gonna continue to adapt and make this happen. So, so thank you, it's, it's, gonna be, it's gonna be wonderful, yeah. <laughs> hey, I think it's worth it. So <laughs> one last thing, and, and uh, I promise I won't touch on COVID anymore, but um, it affected our organization, Geothermal Rising. And so one of those effects, we had to do some cost cutting and we've put a pause on the bulletin, as you guys may have noticed, guys and gals. Um, and so what, um, what we need to do to get that up and running again is I'm recruiting for an editorial board to help out with the, uh, with the bulletin. So if you're interested, please talk to Will or myself. We're, we're trying to get a, a, a founding group together for this editorial board that will help launch it back again. So um, that's all I've got. Welcome and thank you to everyone for being here virtually online. However you're participating, thank you. And now I'm going to turn it over for a brief video on U.S. geothermal in 2021. So welcome. Thanks again.
Wonderful. Well, next up is Dr. Susan Hamm, who um, I'm pleased to introduce. Susan has participated in geothermal rising and GRC prior to that for many years. Susan is the well, actually, Dr. Ham, um, I'm just saying I want to emphasize how, how bright she is, um, is the Director of Geothermal Technologies for the Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy at the Department of Energy. She has led that organization on improved performance, accelerated deployments, and has doubled that budget for geothermal in the last five years. The office is excited to see successes in hydrothermal uh, enhanced geothermal systems and low temperature research and development. And recently has pivoted to add programs that demonstrate geothermal's use on both heat and power, which will support decarbonization of the grid in 2035, as well as decarbonization of the energy sector in 2050. Uh, Dr. Ham has a bachelor's degree from in geology from Amherst College, a master's in geophysics and a PhD in material science from the University of Minnesota. So please welcome Dr. Ham virtually. Thank you. Hi everyone, just making sure you can hear me. John, can you just give me a thumbs up if you can hear me? Uh-oh, can you hear me? Yes, no, yes, okay. We can hear okay. you, we can hear you, sir. Can, awesome. you share, can you share your screen for us? I will share my screen. Give me one second, please. Marvelous, we can see well, it. Well, we're not, well, yeah, we're not quite there yet. Just give me a second here. So let's get the slideshow going. Okay, so I'm assuming that you can now see the, the, pre, the presenter view, the correct yes. view. Yes, we can, so we can All see. All right, so, so I'm not putting on my camera because Will's concerned about um, bandwidth. So I'm just gonna go, you don't get a pretty shot of me. It's fine, y'all know what I look like. So, Actually, so we, should, we should be good for you to show Oh, really? You. Yeah. Okay, let's see if I can figure out how to do that then. Hold on, uh, cause I'm in a different view right now. That may be harder to do than I thought. Yeah, sorry, I can't figure out how to turn on my camera while I'm sharing. Oh, you know what, it's over here. Okay, are we good to go? Are we good to go? Yes, okay. Good to go. Fantastic. All right, well, all these internet troubles notwithstanding, it is fantastic to be able to see you all today. Um, I truly hope that we're gathered under one roof when we, you know, next year, 2022. Yay for GRC 2022. Uh, COVID has thrown us all for many, you know, just many obstacles, many loops over the past year and a half but we've persevered and like you all, we continue to do great work in support of geothermal research. You are the key to our success, right? We've seen dramatic changes in policy and momentum. You've seen the secretary's video um, and just major changes since January. I'm excited to dive in and share some of that with you. But first I wanna reinforce something that is universally shared amongst those of us in the Geothermal Technologies Office, which is that this group, those who come to GRC, even those who are you know, not able to come this year, you are the reason for the success of geothermal in the US and abroad. We have a great community and that's just super, super great appreciated across the, across the board. So let's talk about some of the administration priorities. In January, as the Biden-Harris administration settled in, we knew that there would be policy changes affecting the renewable energy R&D, research and development and deployment. And in short order, the new administration unveiled its Build Back Better campaign, which fully addresses climate change and energy transition with ambitious, much needed goals. And for those of you who listened to Secretary Grinholm's remarks yesterday or those of us that, you know, following along from home couldn't actually hear the video, but we could certainly see the secretary talking. Um, you'll recognize some of the bullet points, right? You probably also notice the secretary's enthusiasm for geothermal energy. From the onset, she's recognized the tremendous untapped value of geothermal energy, and she's been a staunch supporter. She's referenced geothermal energy as the heat beneath our feet frequently. And Build Back Better includes these, these same bullet points, 100% clean electricity by 2035, cut carbon emissions by half by 2030, support the transition of fossil fuel workforce, 
develop, create millions of new, new clean energy jobs. And of course, one of the big ones is deliver 40% of the benefits of the clean energy economy to disadvantaged communities. The photos here show our leadership in action. Last month, the secretary visited Alaska and she spent time with, with Senator Lisa Murkowski meeting with various groups. Some of those discussions focus directly on geothermal opportunities and ways that it can be used to support renewable, um, renewable energy needs for tribal and rural communities. And then here on the bottom left, you see a great picture of our Assistant Secretary Kelly Speaks Bachman hosting President Biden at NREL's Flatirons campus in Colorado where the president spoke on the vital role of renewable energy in building a robust, clean energy future and a stronger economy. So let's talk about the budget status, something that everyone's always really interested in. So where are we in the FY22 budget cycle? Well, October 1 was last Friday, and just in time, the House and Senate passed a continuing resolution to keep the government open until December 3rd, the president signed that. So what that means is that we are in a continuing resolution. We are able to continue to work. We are able to continue to fund. However, we cannot start any new programs until there is a full appropriation. So we're gonna keep on keeping on. Uh, and some of the exciting programs I'm gonna talk about a little bit later are gonna have to wait till later in the year. The current infrastructure bill we don't know where, where that's going. Many of you may know that the infrastructure bill included $84 million for EGS demonstrations. We may or may not see that additional funding. Uh, we also may or may not see additional staffing based on the infrastructure bill. And of course, there's also the reconciliation and all of that is just up in the air and we'll just have to see where that lands. We just don't know at this point. With these new policy changes from the administration, it also comes for a new mission. It's a mission driven by urgency. We're all aware of the evolving impacts of climate change. The Western United States has been hit particularly hard. This is an opportunity space for renewable energy. In July, California, faced with an onslaught of environmental challenges related to climate disruption, issued that emergency proclamation calling for acceleration of renewable energy deployment, including 1,000 megawatts of new renewable power, at 80% or greater capacity, and geothermal is first in line to meet that need. The new mission laid out by EERE mirrors the Biden-Harris administration's goals, and it addresses like two overarching key targets. So first, to equitably transition the U.S. to net zero emissions by 2050, and to ensure that the new clean energy economy benefits all Americans and creates good paying jobs. To that end, GTO will support R&D for technologies to help the U.S. achieve a carbon pollution-free energy sector no later than 2035 through investments in Frontier Observatory for Research in Geothermal Energy, Forge, a drilling technology demonstration campaign, EGS near-field demonstrations, a new initiative aimed at transitioning oil and gas technologies and talent to geothermal energy, and grid policy and regulatory support, just to name a few of the programs coming up. We will also emphasize the administration's goals to reduce the carbon footprint of U.S. building stock by 50% by 2035 through programs des designed to deploy geothermal heating and cooling at federal installations. That'll be in partnership with the Federal Energy Management Program, with this, which is within EERE like us, sister office. Provide technical assistance for communities installing geothermal heating and cooling and collaborate with the Buildings Technologies Office to demonstrate the market viability of geothermal and highly efficient demand flexible low carbon buildings. GTO's programs focus on accruing benefits to disadvantaged communities, geothermal's high capacity factor, small physical footprint, and wide ranging applications ensure that it can be utilized in urban centers, rural areas, and remote communities where geothermal has high technical and economic potential. This slide here, what you're looking at over on the right is EERE program priorities. You've heard about them, decarbonizing the grid, decarbonizing transportation, reducing carbon footprint, enabling a net, six, net zero agriculture sector and decarbonizing energy, energy intensive industries. Over here on the right, on the left, is sort of how we do it, right? We're gonna do it in, with a mind towards environmental justice and equity, towards diversity in STEM. You've heard talks about jobs, and then we really wanna focus on state and local partnerships. So, DOE and EERE has responded to these um, to this focus, right, by coming up with DOE EERE budgets that are increased and reflect the urgency of climate change. 
we really, I talked about those four areas, the workforce, et cetera. We're really focused on cross office collaboration in those areas. One of the big pushes for GTO as always is critical materials, focusing on securing the supply of critical materials that build clean energy technologies. And then we're also working with the secretary on deployment metrics. So we have come up with several ways that we really wanna focus on getting geothermal deployment out there and what we can do to support that. And we are working with the secretary on a biweekly basis to make sure that we're hitting, hitting those, um, those milestones. We also have exclusive innovation prize. This is a prize that identifies and incentivizes actions, activities that will help traditionally underrepresented groups apply for and receive DOE funding. That's always been a that's always been a problem, and especially now as we're looking to accrue benefits to underserved populations, we need to make sure those populations are able to actually receive to apply for and receive DOE funding. There's the local energy action program which you can take a look at, that's provided to low income energy burden communities for community driven clean energy transitions. We have a lot going on with energy and environmental justice and analytical roadmap, metrics and stakeholder engagement guidance, which should come out in, um, in December. So as always, right, we're, we're talking about how, how do we actually, how does GTO actually engage with all of this? Where are we going? So here is the budget that you guys have seen over, this audience has seen over and over through the years. You can see we've gone from 55 to 110, and our request for 22 was 164. The average of the House and Senate marks is here at 135. The House has a mark of 137, the Senate 131. That's, that's a pretty big increase, and we are super excited about what that means. We're going to be focused on driving down the cost of geothermal and ensuring that's integrated into a resilient power system. So we're going to be, what are we doing in FY22? We're going to be renewing the focus on demonstration and deployment. That's one of the big changes from previous years. The last, under the last administration, we were really focused on R&D, basic R&D, basic and applied R&D. Now we're really moving into a lot more demonstration deployment. You're going to see that in our proposed programs. We want to tackle the climate crisis head on. And again, talking about incorporating those tenets of DEI, EJ, workforce development, and so on. So what did we actually request in FY22? This is just a couple of highlights. I have six highlights here that I just wanted to, to go over real quickly. So obviously, we're, we're continuing our work in FORGE, the Frontier Observatory Research in Geothermal Energy. We requested $20 million to move forward with, um, with the next R&D solicitation. And that will obviously contribute to meeting administration goals for a carbon-free electric grid. We have a big funding opportunity coming up in drilling technology demonstration campaign. This campaign is enabling field demonstrations of drilling technologies to prove the utility and the efficacy to attract and to attract future private investment. And we're really aiming to get to that 100% clean energy economy. We know we need to drive down the cost of geothermal and drilling is one of those ways to do that. So look for that in FY22. We have a $10 million geothermal. This is intended to be a multi-year um, consortium. This is just the, the first piece of that. So this is a new consortium designed to leverage oil and gas subsurface industry, people, technologies, talent, um, all that kind of thing to help solve geothermal energy's toughest challenges. That's called geothermal energy from oil and gas demonstrated engineering. Geo, that's both uh, the drilling technology demonstration campaign and geode are things that we will not see until after we have a full appropriation. They will not come out under a continuing resolution. We have some exciting programs in the low temperature space. The first is co community geothermal heating and cooling technical assistance and deployment. The idea here is to fund technical assistance to demonstrate, deploy, and implement community-scale direct-use geothermal district energy systems. That's going to be a combination of geothermal heat pumps and or direct use of geothermal fluids. This, again, is something you won't see until after the continuing resolution is done, but we're going to be moving towards getting this ready to go. We have a federal, we have federal partnerships for geothermal installations, also known as FedGeo partnerships. This is where Geothermal Technologies Office and FEMP are making it possible for federal agencies, DOD, GSA, state, et cetera, to consider geothermal energy to heat and cool and possibly potentially power their installations. 
This last one on the slide is Next Generation Connected Communities. This is a partnership with BTO that I mentioned earlier. And this is looking at using geothermal in um, net zero buildings, basically. So status of ongoing initiatives. We, I wanna just update people on things that are going on. Many of you are aware that we announced our hydro prop selection last month, continuing our research into materials that can improve hydraulic properties within reservoirs. Selectees included Cornell University, Berkeley Lab, Missouri University of Science and Technology, Montana State University, Oklahoma State University, Penn State and the University of New Mexico. Our Wells of Opportunity re-amp selections will be made in November with award negotiations extending into 2022. This research initiative is focused on identifying pathways to use older or decommissioned oil and gas wells for geothermal, for geothermal use. Next month, we will finalize our operating plans with the DOE National Laboratories. I know that quite a few of you are eager to see that completed as are we. Also next month, our phase one winners of the Lithium Extraction Prize will be announced at the COP26 event in Glasgow. I want to extend a big thank you to each of the teams that have been participating in this first stage. The quality of your work and the innovation we're seeing has been tremendous. I'm thrilled to see what's next in phase two. And last but certainly not least, for those engaged in our current student competition, the submission deadline for core materials is November 4th. For those that haven't followed the competition, we've asked teams of student teams to develop proposals for heating and cooling buildings, campuses, or entire communities. This is real world geothermal in action. Final submissions will be due next April with winners announced in May. Direct use geothermal is a major part of our portfolio moving forward, and we're excited to see what the teams come up with. Wrapping up here, I want to call out the importance of all of you here, those, on the, those in the room, those on, uh, on Zoom. With your continued support and engagement, we can continue to make great strides in geothermal R&D. The key is to stay active, working not only on your own projects, but supporting those of fellow researchers and operators. Great work comes not only from the field, but from the laboratories, the classrooms, gatherings like this. I only wish we could be there. And on that note, we are always looking for new merit reviewers. You hear me say this all the time. This is a great way to get more involved in geothermal R&D and learning the ins and outs of how R&D operates and moves forward within, within DOE. And if you're not already on our newsletter distribution list, please don't hesitate. You can sign up today by visiting geothermal.energy.gov. The drill down was launched in May, thanks to Elizabeth Metcalf, our uh, stakeholder outreach and engagement lead. And we've gotten rave reviews from many stakeholders. It will keep you abreast of events, news, and opportunities, including technical sessions on a monthly basis. Thank you so much for joining today. Um, I appreciate all the patience for people as we struggled through the, uh, the, technical, the technical connections, but it looks like we got there. And I hope everyone has a great conference. Thank you so much. Susan, thank you very much. Uh, that was that was really enlightening, and, and um, looking forward to it all. So next up, we have Janae Scott. Uh, Miss Scott is the senior. I'm getting a little bit of feedback here. I don't know if that if anybody else is a senior counselor for the Assistant Secretary of Land Minerals Management at the Department of Interior. Uh, prior to uh, this role, Miss Scott was. Um, Vice Chair of the California Energy Commission, the state's uh, energy and policy planning agency. While at the commission, Ms. Ms. Scott uh, worked on the electric charge program, a um, disadvantaged communities advisory group, Western Interconnection, and hydrogen fuel cells. Um, good grief, there's a ton here. Um, I keep on going through this and just being amazed with how, how much she has accomplished. Um, additional plug-in electric vehicle collaboration, and also even partnering with veterans to, to work on moving the electric vehicle uh, movement forward. Prior, prior to the commission, uh, Ms. Scott worked with the Department of Energy and Office of the Secretary as the Department Counselor for Renewable Energy and Environmental Defense Fund as the Senior Attorney 
at, in the climate and air program. Uh, Ms. Scott has a law degree from the University of Colorado Boulder uh, Law School, as well as master's and bachelor's degrees in energy systems from Stanford University. So please welcome Ms. Scott via video. Thank you very much. Good morning, everyone. Thank you to Will and to the other hosts of the Geothermal Rising Conference for inviting me to join you all virtually today. I am so delighted to be here. My name is Jenea Scott, and I am serving as the Senior Counselor to the Assistant Secretary for Land and Minerals Management at the Department of the Interior. And in that role, I work closely with the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management on offshore wind and with the Bureau of Land Management on renewable energy, solar, wind, and geothermal, and on transmission. As you all know, combating climate change, creating living wage union jobs, and standing up more renewable energy on our nation's public lands are some of this administration's highest priorities. The Biden-Harris administration is committed to prioritizing renewable energy. We are working diligently to meet the 25 gigawatt of renewable energy on our nation's public lands by 2025 goal that was established in the Energy Act of 2020. And we are also working diligently to carry out Section 207 of Executive Order 14008, which is the executive order on tackling the climate crisis at home and abroad. To this end, the team at BLM has assessed renewable energy staffing at BLM and developed a plan for appropriately increasing resources and reestablishing renewable energy coordination offices. BLM has also identified about 17,000 megawatts of solar, wind, and geothermal projects that may help meet the 25 gigawatt goal in the Energy Act of 2020. And BLM has reviewed its current programs to determine which actions can be prioritized to facilitate simpler, but still data-driven and robust processing of onshore renewable energy applications. It is essential to responsibly develop projects this team understands the importance of renewable energy in achieving climate, clean air, clean energy, equity, jobs creation, and a multitude of other goals. But renewable energy is not without its impacts, and we need to be mindful of cultural and species impacts, among others. We recognize that nearly a decade has passed since some of the Bureau of Land Management's renewable energy programs were established. The laws have evolved, the technology has evolved, climate science has evolved, and the need for renewables, clean energy, and transmission has evolved. We also acknowledge that any renewable energy plans need to be equitable and inclusive. And in late September, the Bureau of Land Management hosted a series of listening sessions regarding its upcoming renewable energy rulemaking. And we are thinking both about that medium term rulemaking and also about interim updates that can be made to the program to help facilitate renewable energy projects now. Specific to geothermal, let me share a few numbers with you. The Bureau of Land Management currently has about 388 geothermal leases, 83 of which are in producing status. There are 47 operating geothermal power plants, and those are located in California, Nevada, Utah, and in New Mexico. And together, this is an installed capacity of about 2,500 megawatts. According to the Department of Interior's Economic Contributions Report for the fiscal year 2019, this geothermal is responsible for about $2.05 billion in total economic contributions and about 6,900 jobs. There are currently six geothermal projects in the utilization operations phase, which, if approved, would add about 242 megawatts to the renewable energy mix. So those are a few statistics for you about the status of geothermal at the Bureau of Land Management. We have some geothermal lease sales coming up and geothermal lease sales are anticipated in Nevada in October, in New Mexico in November, and in Utah in January. So please be sure to keep an eye on the Bureau of Land Management's uh, webpage to stay up to date on these lease sales. And for those of you who are following this more in depth, the BLM is working on report to Congress on, on a report to Congress on the suitability of Energy Policy Act of 2005, Section 390 categoric, categorical exclusions for geothermal. And the team hopes to have that completed, that report completed in the next few weeks. Additionally, the Bureau of Land Management is revising its geothermal regulations to update 
geothermal resource operating orders, or GROs, among other items, and is currently estimating that a draft of these revisions will be available in quarter two of 2022. Last, but certainly not least, the Bureau of Land Management is working in partnership with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory to develop guidance and training for the BLM staff. These training videos include everything from an introduction to geothermal energy and Bureau of Land Management oversight of projects, to tutorials on production verification and the production verification tool that BLM uses. Before I close, I want to direct folks to BLM's Active Renewable Energy Projects webpage. This webpage includes projects where a notice of intent has been issued or NEPA is underway, and it'll give you a good snapshot of what BLM is working on. And I also want to highlight for you that we are well aware of the various state policies and actions where BLM and the states could be working hand in hand on advancing responsible geothermal energy development. I look forward to those partnerships. I invite you to reach out to us at any time with constructive comments and feedback for how we can continually work to improve our geothermal projects and process. And please remember to work closely and actively early and often with interested stakeholders like tribes and the equity and conservation communities as you are developing your geothermal project plans. There is a lot of work for us to do to achieve the 25 gigawatt of renewable energy on our nation's public lands by 2025 goal, but it is achievable if we are dedicated, nimble, creative, and working together as partners. Thank you so much for inviting me to provide some remarks to you all. I am just thrilled to be with you virtually. Um, and with that, I will conclude my remarks. Thank you. All right, I'll say that again. Well, thank you, Ms. Scott, uh, for, for that very informative uh, talk. Uh, unfortunately, she wasn't here in person today, but uh, tremendous. We're seeing this on all fronts, a lot of optimism, and I honestly consider myself more of a realist, but everything I hear is looking in the right direction for this, this community. So as we progress forward, let's, let's keep that up. And this is a wonderful venue for collaboration, discussion, impromptu, um, you know, we've got a lot of technical sessions, so looking forward to it all. Um, now I've got to chew and chew gum and walk at the same time and upload the next presentation. So with that, um, give me just a second here if I can, I may need, there we are. Um, I may need a moment of assistance to project that over and what i'm going to hey, step Jim. over and let kelly take on yeah I'll kelly on introducing while we while we do this so again it's all uh, uh about patience so i do want to welcome uh john redfern the president and ceo of ever technologies john redfern is an expert investor advisor and serial entrepreneur um He's a global executive. You know, looking through his bio here, he has traveled and worked in probably most of the world. Um, the, on, the only exception I don't see here, John, is uh, Antarctica. So with that, he's got a, a tremendous experience in data analytics, oil services, oil companies, um, energy tech verticals as well. Um, in his executive experience, he was a director at Hess, president of Acumap, and also president of IHA, IHS Energy in Denver. John has spent uh, the last 13 years prior to his uh, involvement with Ever in China, co-founding a series of startups, including Local Gravity, which is leading the retail data analytics uh, platform in China. As a director, uh, executive advisor over the years, he's worked on commercial strategy, negotiations, alliances, mergers and acquisitions, and private equity. He holds um, a few degrees here, one in energy physics from Queens University in Kingston, law degree from McGill University and an MBA from uh, INSEED in France. So please welcome John to, to the stage here. And I think Kelly was helpful enough to figure out how to get the slides up. So thank you. Thank you for that cool introduction. And thank you for that extra clap <laughs> in the front row. Did you mention Antarctica? 
Yeah, we, we actually are working with some people on a project in Antarctica, but uh, that's the great thing about geothermal. It just goes just about anywhere. We're even talking to the uh, Sovereign Wealth Fund of Bhutan, of all places. So it's, it's truly a universal industry and one of the things that attracts me to it. But I'd like to do something a little just slightly different right now, not talk about regulations, not talk about incremental growth, because I think to make this thing really work, we've got to have outside the box thinking. We've got to be talking about orders of magnitude increase in investment and just, you know, an a go to it att attitude. So the question is we've got three or four different panel sessions where we're going to go into the thermodynamics, the engineering, the physics of, of uh, our solution later. So I don't want to get bogged down in that. I want to go and I don't want to dwell on the fact that. Uh, you know, some of the controversy around EGS being less predictable thermodynamically than ourselves, but we'll let that one lie. And instead talk about what we can do as an industry and to also answer some of your other questions about ever, such as what, are, what in the world are we doing? You know, we seem to be doing stuff that's very ungeothermal. And to that, I'd say there's a method to that. And that's exactly what we're trying to do. So we could also ask not just what in the world are we doing, but you could also ask us what's with all this steampunk fashion in our in our videos, like the Harmony video earlier in the spring. Why are these people all have their head in the ground? Again, the same video. Why do we are we coming out with a time travel movie just in the next few weeks? No, it's not. We're looking for better priority dates for our patents. We already like those, but uh, all will be clear in a minute. The other question is, you know. We answered, we brought up the, the terminology earlier in the year as Zelfa, zero emitting load following resource, which of course a lot of we are here. And you know, stuff like that we popularized, popularized through a Rolling Stone article. And it was in fact a terminology that came up from some of the utilities that we had never heard before. But we got a new one we're gonna launch in the New York Times next week. And uh, I never know how to pronounce this. I are Legan de Volmich Sal. This is uh, going to be another analogy we're using. So hopefully everyone will know what that is, that strange looking beast on the right in a couple of weeks. You could also ask, what the hell was all the obelisks? What, what are these guys doing? Is this a strange homage to Stanley Kubrick and my favorite childhood film, 2001? This, this was spotted, I think, in a building in Brussels. But uh, I think there's some other ones showing up in wind farms out in Palm Springs, I've heard. There's some in various train stations. I think there's even one on the exhi exhibition floor when you go into the exhibition hall later. So what, what's all this craziness for? Why are we doing that? It's all essentially the same answer. It's to try to shock or provoke people into taking a second look at geothermal. Because geothermal, it's sort of like that story you've heard before. I mean, I always get accused of it with my spouse or partner. She'll be saying something, I think I know what she's saying, so I'm not really listening. But as she always points out, you're not really listening. You gotta really hear actively to know what I'm talking about. And the, the industry in general or the, or the world in general, up to very recently, I know we were talking this morning about a lot of progress being made, but you know, up to recently, people weren't really hearing the geothermal story. They weren't really hearing that things were changing. They weren't really hearing that we are this unique, truly scalable, green base load or dispatchable power source. They were just thinking geothermal, I've heard of that before. I'm not gonna worry too much about it and I'll go forward from there. But we, we really noticed it as well because certainly for ourselves and some of the other closed loop people, we had a sort of two-step test. We had to go to people and say, hey, I've seen the future of energy and it's geothermal. And I go, what? A few subset of people would say, the, the more hardcore or longer term geothermal people saying, yeah, I believe in that, but then I took, go turn around and say, and the future of geothermal is closed loop geothermal. That's our particular philosophy. I know other people have different ones. As an entrepreneur, I have to pick what I'm going to, you know, what deck of cards I'm going to play, and I pick the closed loop one. So everything we've done for the last four years has been laser focused on the assumption that closed loop is the way to go, and we're working diligently to take that forward. But so that's why we're doing it. That was the craziness. But, you know, the question is, as we go forward, is there a, if we do get everyone's attention, is there a common message that we can deliver as an industry? And I think there is, because even within the closed loop world, and this is this little uh, chart we'll go over in some of the panel sessions later, people like Sage, Greenfire, and ourselves, we're targeting completely different use cases, completely different markets based on 
you know, the temperature gradient based on the permeability, based on the rock type, based on the end use. And so we're not really competing with each other. In fact, I don't think there's any of my real competitors in this room. You know, it's, it's even, if, even if we all have the same business case, even if we're targeting the same customers, the collective market share of all the geothermal startups in this room is zero. We don't really have any market share yet. And the opportunity is so huge that even if we were going after the same customers, we're not gonna be running into each other. We're not gonna be cannibalizing each other's market share. So we can work jointly. And I think that's important that we go forward and really talk about a common vision. Because the real competition for all of us in this room is simple lack of visibility. We're, we're in here and we feel we're amongst friends and everyone understands geothermal, but you go out in the world, no one really knows us. You know? But there is a common message we can do when it can cover hydrothermal, EGS, closed loop, direct use, district heating, you name it. And they're all, all the things on the right are things we all have. It's always on small footprint, resilient, clean, et cetera, et cetera. So we have a story to tell. Sure, we got a few other wrinkles that we also say, but that's important because if we don't do that and we don't do that with a unified voice, then as I point out here, big wind, big oil, big solar, big storage, big carbon capture, big hydrogen, big nuclear, big fusion, maybe even biomass, all has more of a public visibility. And that's embarrassing if you're coming in behind biomass. But uh, <laughs> sorry, sorry if there's any biomass, but I think I'm pretty safe here. But uh, so, so we think there is, there is a story to tell. And part of, the, part of the thing that I really want to emphasize here is what we're engaged in here is not a zero sum game. When I first started in geothermal way back four years ago, you know, I was shocked was what I heard because I, I was not in that sort of mentality before. We're sitting around in some conference like this. Someone was, notif was noted that someone had won an $800,000 government grant to do something. And I, I said, oh, great, good for them. The other people on the table said, that's terrible. There's going to be less for us. And <laughs> so it, it went from this mentality that there was a certain size pie rather than trying to grow the pie. Whereas the fact is, as we all know now, Part of it's just the right timing right now, but part of the reason lots of people are raising money right now is because other people are raising money. You know, capital likes to go where it feels like it's other people are going at the same time. So we raised you know, $100 million. That doesn't mean it's harder for everyone else. It means everyone else is coming along on, on that same, same scheme. And we got to think bigger. You know, we've been raised our 100 million. We're putting together a billion dollar fund to help fund projects and stuff like that. That's the sort of thinking you need. And you know, for myself personally, does anyone know where this is? This is this is Sengen, where I lived for 13 years. This is 15 million people from zero in 40 years. This is half of all of China's international patents. And China has about the same number as the US, all from this one town that doesn't even have a decent research university. And yet I'm 20 years older than this town. This thing, let that sink in. This is unbelievable. So that's the sort of thing we can do. I think we should be targeting to think that sort of scale. I think we should be trying to put together our own geothermal sengen and uh, kicking ass because there's no reason geothermal shouldn't be on the same sort of level as wind and solar. We're part of the solution, but we got to be bold about it and not, you know, ask for a little bit here, a little bit there. We need to make a big movement. So, but, you know, so, but, you know, the fact is we still have the zero sum mentality a bit. I know there's still people who are sitting there arguing against other people's funding. There are still people who are thinking if someone else gets funded, they don't. We got to get rid of that thinking. We're in a situation now where the, you know, the future is boundless. We got this limitless opportunity. Like I said before, you know, our market shares are so small. We got we really should be collaborating. Along those lines, uh, what I'd like to finish off with is to help the collaboration. We'll be buying drinks tonight at seven o'clock. So everyone go there. Yeah, always popular. And then tomorrow at one o'clock, uh, we're going to have, we like to grandly call it a forge for closed loop, but it's not really that. It's just a bunch of friends getting together, talking about how we can collaborate on the closed loop side, on the drilling side. You know, we all, we all do better if you can get hotter, faster, deeper, cheaper drilling. And we're working with a number of people on that, but we're also working with a number of people on different projects and different research projects in academia, other consortiums, other people you would think are our competitors. So whether you're one of our collaborators right now, come on down and help share what we're doing together. And if you're not or up to now one of our collaborators, 
pop in at one o'clock and join the debate. It'd be great. That's it. Thanks. Do probably need to turn this off. There we go. Thank you very much, John. So, Kelly, I'm going to need you to uh, stop sharing that screen, please. As as we work through that, I appreciate that, John. And I, I think growing the pie is the direction we all need to go and collaborating and making sure that everybody's got the, the same message, whether we're working on closed loop, traditional, or anything else under the sun, heat pumps. It's really once we get that message across to, to the public simply and it's grass, because the challenge that we have is, is what we do a lot of it's subsurface. So when you're driving by the highway, you might see some steam coming out of a cooling tower or something like that, but you don't understand it. Windmills, solar panels, and all these other things, they're easy to grasp. So that's that messaging is important and it's gonna allow us to share that, not share, excuse me, grow that pie. So thank you, John. Um, along with that, I'd, I'd like to welcome Commissioner Douglas um, via video. Commissioner Douglas is the, is a commissioner on the California Energy Commission. Um, Ms. Karen Douglas was originally appointed in 2008 by Arnold Schwarzenegger when he was governor and has continued to stay on the California Energy Commission since that time. She holds the attorney position. Uh, one of the unique things about the California Energy Commission are there are assigned uh, requirements to have professional training in certain sects. Those include uh, physical science, environmental protection, economics, and law. So as a lead commissioner, uh, Commissioner Douglas uh, is leading in power plant siting, uh, environmental protection, tribal affairs, compliance and enforcement, desert renewable conservation plan, and the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management uh, in an intergovernmental inter agency for California. Prior to that, Commissioner Douglas helped oversee the timely allocation of three, $314 million of federal stimulus funds allocated into energy efficiency, renewable energy and energy programs, uh, which benefited the California homeowners, businesses and government entities. Um, she's also focused on build, building efficiency standards and also and uh, television and battery charging standards for for the state. And then prior to her her um, experience on the California Energy Commission, Ms. Douglas or Commissioner Douglas uh, was the director for the California Climate Initiative at the Environmental Defense Fund. And it, through that, she's even worked on the Imperial Irrigation District in San Diego water transfer. Um, Commissioner Douglas holds a Stanford Law degree as well as a master's degree in public policy from the University of Colorado Boulder. So please welcome Commissioner Douglas via video. And thank you very much. Good morning, I'm Karen Douglas. I'm a commissioner at the California Energy Commission, and I'm really pleased to have this opportunity to address you today and to speak to the state's broader energy and policy overlook, and then more specifically, current opportunities for geothermal power and also lithium production from geothermal brines in the Salton Sea area. Um, next slide. So California has, as I think all of you know, very aggressive, climate and renewable energy goals. And we're working very hard and very fast to transition our energy sector to clean electricity. And so you can see from this slide that we're working to decrease greenhouse gas emissions um, to 40% below 1990 levels by 2030 and 80% below that by 2050. We're also working towards a 2045 carbon neutrality goal um, on the renewable side, we're working towards a 100% clean energy standard by 2045. And we're also working towards um, very aggressive uh, um, zero emissions transportation goals, 100% um, um, passenger and light duty zero emission vehicles by 2035. And um, for medium and heavy duty, that target is 2045. Um, 
So at the, at the same time that we're implementing this transition, we're also dealing with the impacts of climate change on the natural environment and on the energy system. And so we have been experiencing um, significant west-wide heat waves, a significant drought that has impacted hydroelectric production, um, and oh, the, the increased wildfires with impacts on transmission and wildfire smoke sometimes um, reducing output of photovoltaic panels. So we're working within a context of real challenges on the electricity side. Um, these challenges, because many times they're west-wide, have also resulted in constraints on imports. And um, just by way of example, in a normal year, we have averaged two flex alerts per summer. This summer, we've already had eight. And of, per of sp particular concern, of course, is the net peak hours. These are the hours of the day when solar electricity is no longer generating very much, but demand is still high and people are still cooling their homes. People are still using a lot of electricity. And, and so these net peak hours are where we've seen particular um, problems in the system. And in, on July 30th, um, Governor Newsom issued a proclamation of a state of emergency to address these projected potential energy shortfalls during net peak hours in extreme weather conditions. The Energy Commission and our partner agencies have been working very closely together to implement the proclamation and achieve energy stability this summer and beyond. And we're working very closely together to accelerate deployment of clean energy solutions um, in the coming years. The Public Utilities Commission recently ordered procurement of 11,500 megawatts of new net qualifying capacity, at least 1,000 megawatts of which is to come from clean firm resources such as geothermal power. So if we could go to the next slide. Um, so a lot of the targets that we're working towards and also the um, coordination and, and planning process that we're following is um, structured through the SB 100 policies and the reports that the California agencies are tasked to produce every four years. And so SB 100 um, set some long-term goals for California. And as we work towards achieving these goals. Um, we've been tasked to come up with a report every four years that, that looks at implementation and looks across um, reliability and, and cost and feasibility and, and, and so on. And, and um, the first report produced through that process came out in March 2021. Um, the report makes it clear that achieving the SB 100 goals is technically feasible um, and also that it will require a very substantially increased and sustained build out of clean energy projects. Um, as a result of those findings, the Energy Commission, the Public Utilities Commission and the California Independent System Operator initiated a collaborative process to look more closely at what that means and what needs to be done to achieve that level of build out in the state. And um, so we've had a couple of workshops on this. We're looking forward to an active stakeholder dialogue. And, and I just wanted to say a few things about the next step in that, which is the ISO 20 year transmission outlook. So if we could go to the next slide. So um, one of the steps that we're, we're taking in this is to have the independent system operator do a 20 year transmission outlook. And by looking longer term, the hope is that they'll be able to get a more comprehensive perspective on different transmission, different potential transmission solutions, how they interact and um, how they uh, either in isolation or more importantly together might help us achieve our goals. And so, the independent system operator in order to do this outlook needed to have a land use and resource-based starting point to, to do that work with. And so 
the Energy Commission worked with our partner agencies to produce a starting point. And um, we took the core scenario from the SB 100 report, but we made some changes to that scenario in order to help the independent system operator do what we viewed as a kind of, as the a, a more useful analysis. And, um, you know, I, I'd encourage all of you to take a look at that starting point. It's in the Energy Commission docket and, um, and, and the ISO just had a, a workshop where they discussed how they're planning on using it. For the purposes of geothermal, I just wanted to point out that um, the resource map on this slide shows geothermal resources around the state in orange. But we asked the ISO to focus primarily on looking at new geothermal in Imperial. And the reason for doing that was to see the potential and, and understand the transmission implications of a substantial build out of geothermal power in Imperial Valley. We were also, of course, very cognizant of the lithium production opportunities in Imperial Valley. And if we could go to the next slide, I wanted to talk a bit more about the Lithium Valley vision and the opportunities that it presents. So um, the uh, Lithium Valley vision first contemplates the, the potential of producing lithium from geothermal brines. And I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that in a moment. But um, beyond that, of course, there's a tremendous opportunity to be able to utilize the lithium and the presence of so much clean energy power from geothermal and from solar and, and wind and other resources to, to set in place a broader local supply chain that supports our clean transportation and um, clean energy goals on the battery side. And, and so the real potential here is, is not only to spur lithium production in California, but also to be able to serve as a cornerstone for a lithium ecosystem that could attract manufacturers across the battery supply chain. By conservative estimates, global lithium battery demand will increase tenfold in the next decade. Um, and it could be more than that. And so, and, and of course, lithium is a critical mineral in that battery supply chain. If we could go to the next slide. Um, so I'll say a few words about the lithium resource under the Salton Sea. Um, the, the geothermal brines under the Salton Sea are believed to have probably the highest concentration of lithium of any geothermal brines in the world. Um, the geothermal brines are already brought to the surface by existing geothermal power plants, which of course use those brines to um, generate renewable electricity and then uh, re-inject them into the reservoir. And so the, the lithium recovery can be done as an add-on to existing geothermal plants where the lithium is recovered or extracted from the brines before they are re-injected into the reservoir. It's a very environmentally um, benign way of producing lithium, especially compared to other ways of producing lithium throughout the world. I mean, this is, this is really a wonderful opportunity to both um, expand the clean energy production in this area and also to be able to recover lithium that exists in high concentration in salt and sea brines. The process is still relatively new and it will take time to get to the point of being able to have um, large scale production, but there's tremendous progress being made. And um, we're really excited about the demonstration projects that are already underway in, in Imperial Valley. And if we could go to the next slide, I won't read this really, but I just wanted to show that um, just last year, the Energy Commission awarded $10 million in grants from the Electric 
program investment charge program or EPIC program to help support um, Lithium Valley and help expand California's emerging lithium recovery industry. In prior years, um, the Energy Commission has also supported this effort through both EPIC funds and through GERDA or uh, Geothermal Grant and Loan Program funds. These efforts are also aligned with um, great support from the federal administration. Um, if we could go to the next slide, please. Um, so one of the really nice opportunities um, that the Energy Commission has had is to um, establish the, a Blue Ribbon Commission on Lithium Extraction. This commission was established through AB 1657. And um, commission members are appointed by a combination of the governor, the Energy Commission, or other state agencies, the Speaker's Office, and the Senate Rules Committee. The commission holds public meetings, and the Energy Commission is working very closely with the Lithium Valley Commission to support their work and to engage the community, nonprofits, and environmental justice advocates to ensure that we're thoroughly assessing the opportunities, challenges, um, and potential impacts of the Lithium Valley effort and to make sure that, that we are effectively communicating and um, making information available to the public about this, um, about this tremendous opportunity and, and what, it, what it means and how lithium can be produced from salt and sea brines and just giving people a chance to get their questions answered. Um, the Lithium Valley Commission will produce a report to the legislature on their findings by October 1st of 2022. And in addition to forming the Lithium Valley Commission, the legislature has also convened a select committee on California's lithium economy, which is chaired by assembly member Eduardo Garcia. Um, the committee is expected to issue a report next year on economic opportunities in this area. So if we go to the last slide, um, I guess that's just my contact information for myself and my advisors. I just wanted to conclude with a few key takeaways. Um, California is well on its way to a clean electricity grid um, and geothermal resources are an important part of helping California implement its clean energy transition. Um, we're excited about the potential for producing lithium from salt and sea brines. And there are a number of public processes underway. The Energy Commission, um, the Independent System Operator, the Air Resources Board, the CPUC, to evaluate key topics in the energy transition and um, as we move forward. Um, I really want to encourage all of you to engage with us at the state of California, as well as our, our local partners as we move forward in this transition. And again, I appreciate the opportunity to participate in this conference. Thank you very much. Wow, so uh, more optimism. <laughs> That's gonna be our theme this, this uh, annual meeting. What, what, I, what I really like about Commissioner Douglas's uh, presentation there is highlighting the, I don't wanna diminish it, but the bolt on effect that lithium provides for this industry, you know, initially here in the Imperial Valley, but as we start to seek out and see if there are other resources out there that, that may have a, similar concentrations or ones that we can, we can harness. Um, but also the evaluation is the system as a whole. What, what we're doing here is not just trying to pre produce geothermal power, but, but deliver that energy to the state of California, to this Western US, to the world. And so if we don't have the right transmission in place, it does us no good to drill more wells or produce more power. Um, we need to get it out and serving the customers. And so it's a key piece of the, uh, of the puzzle. 
And really, if you look at it from a supply chain perspective, so I guess, thank you, Commissioner Douglas for that. I, I um, really appreciate your participation in, in uh, the California Energy Commission's engagement. So looking at that supply chain piece of the puzzle, we go from drilling wells, harnessing the power, sending it down on the grid, adding lithium out there for electric vehicles and other, other uh, needs. And so uh, with that, I'd like to introduce the beginning part of that supply chain. Uh, David Arias is the executive vice president of Kenai Drilling. Uh, David Arias is a, is a uh, I guess, Kenai Drilling is a partner with Cal Energy and has been doing our, our drilling work for the past few years and even before that, but uh, that's where I was most engaged with him. David has 44 years of experience in geothermal and oil and gas on the drilling and drilling services side. He has done a little bit of everything along the way. He knows the industry well. He knows everybody well here in California. And, and I want to welcome here on, him here on stage to um, say a few words. So thank you. Hey, hey John. We're just going to um, try starting the video on that computer. You're right. You're right. Here we go. Do you want that? Serves me right for trying to angle it. Yep. <laughs> um. ah. John, when's this one? All right, David, you're ready to go. <clears throat> Good morning. I, uh, my name is David Arias. Like John said, I'm the chief executive officer, general manager for Kenai Drilling. We have operations in California and in the mid-continent. I want to start by apologizing to Kelly. Kelly's been on sending me emails for the last couple of weeks asking for my bio and uh, my title and everything else. But I'm happy to say I've been on vacation for the last couple of weeks and I've been fishing and golfing and uh, moving into a new home. And so I kind of feel bad about not sending Kelly my uh, resume but after the previous speakers, I'm glad I didn't. Uh, you know, it kind of, kind of reminded me of a, a Christmas letters that my mom would send. You know, she would say, you know, we're proud of our oldest sister, Terry. She's a graduate of Cal State, Santa Barbara. She's got a degree in political science. And after getting her degree, she's decided to be a stay-at-home mom. And her and her husband have adopted four children and they're happily raising four children. Our other son, Andy, has graduated from San Jose State with a business degree. He started his own business in rapid transit in the San Jose area and doing for still very good. And our son, David, he turned another year old today. <laughs> but I, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to be here. And, you know, I know a lot of people you know, there's a lot of excitement in it, and it's really good for all the industry of what's going on in geothermal. And I'm happy to say that Kenai has been involved in the geothermal all along. We've never left. We've been here. Um, the first project that uh, Kenai was involved in was Cal Energy. It might have been Magma Power back in the 90s, and we've continued to stay here, and we're going to stay here. We, um, we have worked for the, the previous uh, presenter had a map up of all the areas in California with geothermal, and we've been involved in every one of those fields. I just took a quick glance at it, but, I, but I've been involved. And so what I really wanted to do this morning is thank everybody for supporting us because we've been on the up and downs just like you have. We experienced it on the oil and gas, and we've experienced it in the geothermal. And uh, you've never left us, and we've never left you. So it's a good partnership. And, uh, you know, I want to thank, in, in no particular order here, just uh, some notes that I took is, you know, we worked 
We just recently completed a long project for Calpine up in the geysers. We started the project operating one of their rigs and then we brought in one of our rigs. We were there for over 18 months, thanks to Brad and Dan Cole and Adam Miller for allowing us to participate in that project. We've done work for ORMAT over the years, including Heber, Nevada. We are currently involved in the project in Mammoth, working for Patrick Walsh, Toby Marble, and uh, their team. And I'm sorry if I have forgot anybody. And um, we we are not we we were involved in a project at Patu. I see Fred sitting out there, and uh, you know, Gradient Resources uh, decided to make a change in 2011. And they hired Kenai to come operate a couple of their rigs. They had a couple of conventional drilling rigs, drilling in Patua. And uh, they were aware of Kenai. So they went to a contract versus employee management. We uh, ran two of their rigs. And we ended up bringing one of our rigs up there and worked for Fred and Mark Steffens and the uh, Radiant people uh, for quite a while. Um, on the Forge project, the initial well, Bill Rickard and the GRG group, Dr. Moore, we provided a rig up there on the initial well prior to being uh, given that grant money. Uh, Terra Jan, Dixie Valley, we, Joe Greco, Jess McCullough, we were involved in uh, several cleanouts out there. One of the projects we did was a company owned rig that was owned by Terra Jan during the slow or during the oil and gas boom of 2000, early 2000. As a lot of you remember, geothermal operators couldn't get rigs. So a lot of geothermal operators built rigs. TerraGen was one of those. We provided the labor on that rig for quite a while, not only at Dixie Valley, but at COZO. And then at COZO, we've been involved there for a long time. Uh, we do a lot of cleanouts with one of our conventional rigs for Chris Ellis and his team, Hudson Ranch. Energy power. We just recently completed a work at, a workover for Susan Petty and the CERC team, the Energy Source, with a, uh, working closely with the Louis, Louis and Louis Capiano, and uh, I think that was a very successful project. And uh, also at, at uh, Cal Energy, John touched on Cal Energy. We we just when we're getting ready to go back to work, we hope in November here and. Uh, We've been working pretty steady for Cal Energy for the last five years, and we worked for them prior to that. It's been a very successful project. It's been a very safe project, and I want to touch on one of those things is that Kenai Rig 16 has been at Cal Energy since the start of 2015, I believe. Maybe No, 2016, I'm sorry. And uh, about 60 days ago, Rig 16 celebrated 10 years without a recordable safety incident on that rig. 10 years on the drilling rig. We're, we're, really, really, we're really, really proud of that. We're proud of our safety. We're committed to it. We're proud of you as operators and service providers that work with us on our rig to help us keep safe. Uh, five of those 10 years were with Cal Energy. And um, I just want to ask you or welcome you to our booth. Kenai's here to stay. We have the experience, whether it be new technology rigs, which, you know, it's, it, the, it was brought up about the Lithium Valley. We're getting ready to bring one of our state-of-the-art rigs to the Imperial Valley. We're gonna be working closely with the CTR folks on this project. We're working with a, uh, they have a drilling engineer, drilling manager that, you, that has been brought in from the oil and gas side, Mr. Nathan Silva. Mr. Silva and Keen and I worked together very closely for the past 15 years. So we have the experience on both sides to make projects successful. We also have worked conventional rigs for other operators. So whether it be technology that's been around for a long time on the rig side or new technology, we're here to serve. And uh, I wanna encourage you, Colin Chris, He's uh, one of our corporate development people. He will be speaking midday tomorrow. And Tim Christ, who is the owner of Kenai Drilling, will be speaking on a panel with Bill Rickard uh, tomorrow. We welcome you to come by and say hi. Thank you.
Thank you, David. Well, well said. Um, and I can't speak enough for that safety record. You know, it, it, it's a reminder here with with masks and COVID, and I take that off and I take it back on. But but if we can't do this safely, it's we've got to find another way. And and so Kenai has done a great job in an in an industry that's that's traditionally known to be very uh, very unsafe. So it, it's it's tremendous to see that that's that's achievable, and in in the path forward even. So next up, um, I promised myself I wouldn't try to say too many ums and ahs, but I guess I didn't. Anyways, next up, uh, we have Amelia. Amelia has, um, Amelia Ida Levitin, Letvin, excuse me, Amelia. Um, Amelia has been a huge driver in our diversity, equity, and inclusions task force. This task force was started up less than a year ago. Amelia was one of the advocates that helped get it off the ground. Um, and Amelia is from the geothermal industry. She's an ge independent geothermal geologist who specializes in rig site support as well as conceptual modeling. In addition to her participation in the, uh, the DEI task force, diversity, equity, and inclusion, Amelia is also an active member within the Women in Geothermal known as WING. Um, she drives their social media team, newsletters, and the Core Value Awards. And what else am I going to? <laughs> okay, so with that, um, you know, I guess what, what I have to say about Amelia is, is she really has driven this forward, and, and I'm happy to have her here to share some of the results of her first DEI survey and, and something we want to integrate and make sure that it gets to the point where we aren't even talking about DEI because it's part of our culture, it's part of our core, and, and it's just part of how we, we operate and do things in this community. So thank you very much, Amelia, and uh, please welcome her. <clears throat> Hello. <laughs> I'm uh, it's my first plenary presentation. So here we go. I would like to introduce myself, although John just did. Um, as he mentioned, I'm a part of Women in Geothermal and the Geothermal uh, Diversity, Equity and Inclusion Task Force. And I've also been working in the geothermal industry in many different capacities over the last 10 years. And I would like to include some facts that we learned about in, from a DEI professional that when introducing yourself, especially at a conference like this, it's important to include personal pronouns and privilege and a land acknowledgement. So my personal pronouns are she, her, and hers. I was born and raised in the USA and I come from a position of white middle-class privilege. And it's, it's not a bad thing. It doesn't mean that I'm a hard worker, but it means that there were tailwinds that helped to push my, my trajectory forward. And I'd also like to do a land acknowledgement which is a uh, ancient custom of indigenous people. Um, 500 years ago, when Spaniards landed here, they encountered the Kumeyaay uh, nation. And the Kumeyaay lived here from San Diego to the Salton Sea and down into Baja, California for 10,000 years before that. And they were um, pastoralists, they were hunters and gatherers, and um, they were very friendly people when the Spaniards came, not knowing what was coming next. So I want to define the terms that we will be discussing in this presentation so that we're all on the same path. Um, as Will mentioned yesterday in the presentation, um, 
Some people are not familiar with DEI. Some people are very intimately familiar. So a little breakdown, diversity is, um, it, it describes a protected class. So race, gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation, disability. It doesn't include things like, I'm a libertarian and I have blue eyes. These are, these are not protected classes. Equity is integration of people who've been historically excluded and is meant to um, juxtapose equality, meaning that everybody gets the same boost. Some need a, a bigger boost because they've been repressed for longer. And inclusion, it's the last letter of DEI, but in, in all honesty, it's the most important. Um, there is a quote that diversity is being brought to a party, but inclusion is being asked to dance. So that's what makes people feel welcome, makes them feel part of the community and makes them contribute. And that's what we all ultimately want is contributions from, from diverse people. Marginalized groups are groups that have been systemically undervalued. And an ally is a person who supports a group that they're not actually part of. Um, so WING, last one, Women Geothermal, has a big advocate for wingmen joining the, the organization because it's crucial to the, the whole concept to have allies who support you. And, and that's part of the, the pronouns at the beginning of your, an introduction. So why is, is this important to us? So of course it's nice and it, it's, it's something that we all agree should happen. But, um, I'm sorry, I was thinking of the wrong slide. <laughs> um, I'm gonna tell you about the origin of the, the GRC DEI task force. It was created or it was brainstormed in 2020 prior to pandemic. And over that year, there was action within the board of directors to take a forward, a formal stance against or regarding DEI in the community. And from that, there was the birth of the task force and the group initially kicked off in January of this year. Um, earlier today, Joanna gave a, a presentation that included the, the vision statement that we, that we put together that was submitted to the board of, of directors and was approved and is now on the website for everyone to look at and better understand the stance that we take. And, um, and then very importantly, we wanted to take the pulse of the community. We wanted to know what our demographics were made of, identify areas that could use um, additional support and, and work to improve those. So the survey that probably most of you got in your email is to establish a baseline. And I'll be presenting the results of that survey in a couple slides. Um, so why is it important? It's, um, it's when you have a diverse group, there have been studies that prove uh, diverse groups are more successful, higher innovation, higher performance, um, and increased morales. So all of those things are good for business. It makes, it makes monetary sense to have more diversity. So here are the results. We're data-driven scientists, we wanna know numbers. And I'm gonna start by extending a huge thank you to the people who, who did participate in the, uh, in the survey. We did not get a large amount of responses, but components of the survey are now built into the GR membership. So when you sign up again next year, you'll be automatically contributing and it won't feel like an extra to-do item. Um, so the, the first pie chart here shows the age range and something really important to notice is the, the gray and the orange are about half of the pie and those are 25 to 44. So I, I don't believe this uh, accurately represents the age of the industry. There was higher response from, from younger people. However, 
the, the, the right side pie chart shows what area of the industry you're working in. So there's academics, uh, government, student, um, developer, consultant, and we have a little bit of each of them. So that helps to indicate that the, the results are overreaching for, for the whole industry. Um, we, there was a small percentage of people who discussed having a disability, only 7%. But of those results, we had feedback like uh, smell sensitivity. So when the conference is in an old casino and there's that soaked in um, smell and smoke, it's, it's very uh, disturbing. And also uh, colorblindness. And these are both disabilities that are not immediately apparent to a person. They're essentially hidden disabilities. So you, you don't know necessarily who around you um, identifies with having a disability. And the next to that <clears throat> is sexual orientation. And the, the most interesting part of this is the preferred not to say is 7%. So that's, that's half of the, um, the non-heterosexual group. And within the, um, the queer um, contingent, there's a big sense of pride, of owning your identity, of pridefully saying, I'm coming out of the closet. And here we have 7% who are not comfortable saying that, they don't feel welcome. And um, that's a, a way, a, a spot that we could work on to be, to be more inclusive. And here's the, the pie chart of people in the geothermal industry who have felt discrimination or harassment. Um, so the blue of the main pie is no. And then we have the yellow pie, which is yes. And then the, the bar that pops out from there is a breakdown of the gender identification of the people who said yes. So there are um, a quarter essentially of, of people in the geothermal industry have felt harassed or discriminated against. And um, uh, that's, this is a, a spot that I think we, we should take a mental note of and, and reflect that may, if this is a surprise to you, maybe, um, maybe it's a chance to become more involved and active. And this is a similar pie chart, but it's specific to GRC events. Um, a smaller number of, of people experience discrimination and harassment, um, but it's still there. I, the, the left side is percentage and the right side is the actual number. And I think the actual number was around 25. Um, and I want, to, I want to relay a story with this. Um, I, of working on a rig with a, a drilling company and it wasn't Kenai because they had a few deaths <laughs> and they were talking about their HSE plan. And they said, last year we had two deaths and we aim to drop that percentage by 50%. And everyone's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. We're gonna, we're planning for one death, <laughs> but it's not, it's you, you, you plan to, to decrease. You don't, like, I don't wanna say we're gonna drop this in half, but I also know realistically it's a progression and there's, there's work along the way that, that helps get to the end result. Um, so this is to, to make it personal. This is a, a breakdown of, of gender identity within the, the geo, geothermal community. And it is majority male, but there's, there's still a, a significant female force. And there are several um, smaller groups that are gender non-conforming, gender queer, non-binary, self-described. Um, and, and using the, the, the pronouns is the way to help them feel more welcome and accepted. Um, also the breakdown of the number of women who were um, harassed or felt harassment or discrimination is approximately one in five of the, the female respondents. So if you look around this room and identify five women, 
one of them could have, may have, likely has. So it's, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a high number and it's something that we are paying close attention to. But I also want to say this, this isn't a blame game. We're not, not trying to throw anybody under the bus. It's to gain awareness of where we are and work towards um, the better future that we choose, which is a quote from Christiana Figueres, personal hero. And the demographics. So this one's interesting because people who are geothermal rising members are also automatically IGA members. So if you happen to be an, a geothermal rising member and you didn't know it, you are also part of IGA. Um, and the, in, in the uh, demographics in the upper corner, Caucasians are half and um, non-Caucasians are the other half. And we chose to not put this in a pie chart to represent that because there was the option in the survey to check more than one box. So you could, we have people who fall under several categories. And that's also a characteristic of the next generation. There's, there's more um, mixed uh, diversity of, of demographics. There's, there isn't just one box that you check oftentimes. So this is a, a result from Christofferson et al. from WGC 2021 this year, hot off the press. Um, they did a study of 40 years of, of geothermal um, because what I'm showing you is just year one. This is our first data point and this is going back to the, uh, 1980. And um, the left is female board members and the right are female authored papers. And there is a very distinct uh, trend up and to the right. And you can see the board members in 2021 for both uh, GR and IGA are at or above 50%. So we're working to get um, gender diversity in positions of leadership, which is great. Um, and then on the right side, it's a uh, geothermal rising Stanford and World Geothermal Conference papers. So they're, they're all in the same trend together. So I've mentioned that we're trying, well, I don't know if I have, but now I'm gonna mention that we're trying to attract millennials and Gen Zers. And the, the next generation has different values. They, they value making a difference over making a million. And they also have an understanding that decisions made today have long-term effects. And um, they also value over-communicating with miscommunicating, which is sometimes seen as an obnoxious obsession with social media. But when it comes down to the workplace, it, it helps better communicate with your, your team, your leaders, your, um, your supervisor. Um, they see that glaciers don't last forever, lakes can dry up, you know, the environment will change, but at the same time, policy and leadership can change. So where we are now with policy and leadership isn't where we'll be in four years. And, um, and there you can be a change maker and have an impact in that. Um, and another thing is, there's an expression of being colorblind but there, there's a recognized importance of not being totally blind because some of our differences can be our strengths. Being, um, what am I trying to say? A quote from Albert Einstein, don't judge a fish by how he rides a bicycle. You know, so there, everybody's a genius at something. You just have to figure out what it is. Um, and some clip art just to drive it home. What does it mean to be green? Green future, green energy, or green greenbacks? So this is a picture of me on a work site where I am the only Caucasian and the only female. Um, and this it, it, being it, the only one can be, 
you know, lonely at times, but I was never felt excluded. This was a great story of inclusivity where I was there as the um, geology, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, well site geologist. And I was included in all the decision making, making meetings. And my opinion was valued and listened to. And sometimes I had to fight, but that's just typical on a drill rig. It wasn't female oriented. And this is a photo. I, I happened to be there on my birthday. So it, it, it's a funny one, like where's Waldo right there in the middle. And another great quote, I may be the first, but I will not be the last. So what is our takeaway? We are all in this together. This is not a minorities or a woman's problem. We are all in this. And we wanna find solutions that are inclusive, um, such as being an ally, showing that you are supportive of people if it's not immediately available and act with and for the interest of marginalized people. Oh, and uh, John mentioned this during my intro as well, that our hope is to, to end up where this kind of behavior is just not seen in the geothermal community. Somebody will say, you're like, oh, I'm so harassed in the oil and gas industry. You say, that's not how it is in geothermal. No, no shade to the uh, ONGs. So what can you do? This is a take home message. Um, while we're here this week at networking events, approach and discuss things with people who you might not have a history with. Try to expand your comfort zone. Um, and then after this meeting, go home to your offices and start more awareness in the company and the organization with HR, include leadership. And there's also national groups that you can go to for support. Um, they'll give you talking points, book clubs, presentations. There's a lot of support out there for people who are interested. Um, and there's a, a saying of the good old days, and that is, it's, a, it's become a thing where you say, well, the good old days, I'm like, well, it wasn't good for me. So um, acknowledge that, that difference. And of course, support wing. So I would like to extend a huge thank you to Geothermal Rising. They've really prioritized this. Um, Will and Vicki have been an active part of the DEI task force. Um, Will discussed it last night at the opening session and the opportunity to speak today at the plenary. And they recognize their role in the geothermal community to be a leader and to lead us forward. So leading by example is, is the best way to do that. And uh, tomorrow, Tuesday, there will be a plenary, or I'm sorry, panel discussion from 10.30 to 12.30. Um, that will, is the DEI panel discussion. And uh, we have a gender uh, balanced team. It'll be moderated by Garen Thomas and it should be really excellent. So if you're available, tune in. And then after that, from 12.30 to 1.30 is the Wing Awards uh, workshop. So you can come over to WING. We're going to give out the uh, core value awards, do an update on what we've been doing, what we're up to. And we're going to pick a name and number from a hat for the wine raffle. So if you haven't entered the wine raffle yet, it's, uh, you go to our booth in the expo hall and leave your contact info. And that's it. So current status goals and ways forward. Thank you for your attention today. Thank you, Amelia, that, that was great. I really, really appreciate you um, sharing what we've started to learn about ourselves um, and how to progress and move forward. And so make sure that everybody you are around during this conference feels welcomed, respected, and safe. I, I, I think that's the way it distills down 
for me in a very simplistic manner. Um, my pronouns are he, him, and his. Um, at least those are the ones that uh, people who like me like to use. Um, <laughs> I am a wingman. Uh, I grew up in the Midwest in Missouri. I am ha half Hispanic. And thinking about what Amelia said reminded me of a very kind thing that happened to me as a kid growing up there in the Midwest. There, there were no other Trujillos in the small rural school that I, I grew up in. So anytime I get called up for an award, the teachers would stumble through my name and say, John Trujillo. And my class would always shout back, Trujillo. And it was a really great organic way to make sure that everybody felt, make sure I felt welcomed and included. So Think about those little things as you work through here and just 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 um, take that extra moment to make sure that everybody feels welcome and included and of course safe. So with that, I would like to welcome remotely with us Michelle Ramirez uh, with the International Renewable Energy Agency Global Geothermal Alliance. And I may have to do a stop share as we are doing this. There we go. <clears throat> Uh, this is facilitated by IRENA, where they lead the coalition on the use of geothermal energy. During the last 10 years, Michelle has collaborated with the governments of Latin America, international agencies, um, stakeholders, and law firms in Mexico. Since 2013, Michelle has been uh, involved in the design and implement implementation of public policies and regulatory regulation with the energy transition focused on geothermal. Um, she's known well for her contributions to geothermal in Mexico, Honduras, and Panama. Um, and what I find amazing, because it's a unique person that's able to do this, is to translate analytical and logical technical work into public policies and legal wording. That is, that's impressive, Michelle. Thank you. And so on a personal note, uh, Michelle also works um, and is committed to gender equity issues and also to combat uh, discrimination. So welcome, Michelle. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Jan. Thank you, everyone. We have prepared a few words for you. Uh, and well, let's get started. Uh, I'm pleased to be here with all of you at the GRC, uh, Geothermal Industry Permanent uh, Annual Conference, reflecting the global state of the sector. This conference, as usual, gathers the geothermal community, bringing together people, people in industry, academia, government, and the general public. Uh, this event hosted by Geothermal, rising the oldest geothermal association, serving as one of the main promoters of geothermal energy and its technologies. Thank you very much for having us. Uh, we at the International Renewable Energy Agency and at the Global Geothermal Alliance congratulate Geothermal Rising for their success in conceptualizing and organizing this event ahead of one of the harshest times in recent history in view of the global COVID-19 pandemic that after nearly two years since it began has imposed us to communicate and work in all foreseen manners thanks to the ever-evolving technology and tools. And fortunately, with the hard work and sacrifice of countless people, we are once again reconquering the public spaces much needed for a face-to-face -face debate on other pressing matters like climate change, decarbonization of energy sources, and of course, geothermal. The Global Geothermal Alliance, facilitated by the International Renewable Energy Agency, serves as a platform for dialogue, cooperation, and coordinated action between the geothermal industry, policymakers, developers, and financial institutions, among other relevant stakeholders worldwide. Uh, the GGA was launched back in 2015 at COP21 as a coalition for action to increase the use of geothermal energy, both in power generation and direct use of heat in the context of energy transition and climate action. We call on governments, business, and other stakeholders to support the deployment of reliable geothermal potential. And we have two aspirational goals. First, to achieve a five-fold growth in the installed capacity for geothermal power generation, compared to 2014 levels. And second, we had an initial goal set for geothermal heating of more than two-fold growth in geothermal heating by 2030, compared to 2014 levels also. Uh, but this, this goal was recently updated through an energy compact we had in partnership with the International uh, Geothermal Association 
And through this energy compact, that goal was defined so that the meaning of the more than the full goal is now clear and more ambitious. And we also uh, added uh, cooling to our goal. So geothermal applications for cooling will be included. Now our goal is to achieve a threefold growth compared to 2040 levels for geothermal heating and cooling in 2030. We at the Global Geothermal Alliance also foster an enabling environment to attract investments in geothermal energy and promote models for sharing and mitigating risk in order to attract private investment and integrate geothermal facilities into energy markets. Although we do not directly provide financing for geothermal projects, we provide policymakers, geothermal developers, investors, and other stakeholders with a platform for active dialogue. We provide customized support to regions and countries with a geothermal market potential, facilitating the exchange of insights and experience among key stakeholders in the geothermal energy value change. And finally, we also help to streamline outreach efforts to give geothermal energy a much needed greater visibility in the global energy and climate debates. It is clear that geothermal energy should be an essential component of the energy transition towards a sustainable model not only because it is the only renewable source capable of providing reliable base load and flexible power, but because additionally it has a negligible GHG emissions and it's a resource resilient to the effects of climate change. Additionally, it also produces carbon-free heat that can be used for industrial and other productive applications among a plethora of benefits. Nevertheless, uh, our geothermal industry historically has struggled to position itself as an attractive investment for big players due to the high initial investment cost, uncertainty in the precise location of resources, and a lack of awareness of its full benefits, preventing us from reaching our true potential as the stample energy of the 21st century. However, I'm beyond amazed hearing that the USA measures to combat climate change with uh, geothermal as a key player. Uh, now, in geothermal direct uses, we know geothermal direct uses play a crucial role in the developing world as a tangible manifestation of the geothermal energy which play, uh, helps to close the gap of understanding and acceptance by communities, especially when these communities are involved and experience the benefits of the projects. This is small direct use projects like aquaculture, greenhouses, or food dehydrators have proven to bring a noticeable boost in the local economies. These demonstrable benefits also has the potential to pave the road for the acceptance of larger and more ambitious projects like district heating and cooling and power generation. And what is important is that this trend seems to be replicable across regions like Africa, Latin America, and Asia, where direct uses will become a foundation of a new wave of geothermal development. Even when the key international organizations such as IRENA are working restlessly to for, uh, foster geothermal through technical assistance, risk mitigations, financial scheme, pilot projects, and developing assessments in several topics, geothermal energy is still disregarding some power generation expansion plans and decarbonization strategies. However, we are working hard to ensure geothermal energy is, on this, is understood as a key element to combat the current climate crisis that should be upscaled to be economically competitive beyond a handful or region. The thermal industry has basal reliability, economical value, cost effectiveness, and almost zero emissions. The thermal faces other source of power generation, which benefit from the inertia of continue evaluating their renewable by their levelized cost of energy does not take into account the totality of their externalities and some associated heating costs, such as full cycle emissions and the burden of their intermittency in the power system that usually entails increased fossil fuel-based generation reserves. And a large of investments in transmission networks or storage technologies, as well as their vulnerability to weather events associated with climate change. So in order to make geothermal attractive and facilitate its competitiveness in the future, we need to work together more than ever. It is now imperative for the geothermal industry to engage with the international community and policymakers to ensure that both groups respond appropriately, creating a business environment that recognizes the particularities and benefits of this technology and allows the energy sector to take advantage of the opportunities brought by geothermal energy. I see this GRC as a crucial space for stakeholders to address the climate crisis on global level and discuss more aggressive measures from the geothermal sector to mitigate it. This is a direct context to thermal energy is a unique way to do so in a sustainable manner. And the message should not only reach the representative of countries, but also engage all public and private stakeholders to position 
this technology in the global spotlight. We know geothermal has the potential to change the way we have generated energy electricity so far substantially to meet the world needs in the context of the energy transition and climate action. And we have the responsibility to work uh, to position geothermal energy on top of everyone's minds when talking about renewables. Even when the traditional source of renewable energies are responding to meet the world's needs in the context of climate action, geothermal could improve the context considerably and satisfy the power demand more efficiently. We all know the advantages of geothermal energy represent. Unlocking geothermal potential is not an easy task. Nevertheless, we have no doubt we can do it. We have the most collaborative, talented, open, and diverse community. We always keen to join forces to achieve our goals. Our innovations and teamwork will break down all barriers. We are confident the time for geothermal has come. Geothermal energy is an agent of change. And finally, the energy sector is ready for us. Well, with that, I thank you, Jerma Rising, once again for letting us be part of these fundamental discussions. And I want to thank you all for your time and consideration. And stay safe and enjoy the GRC. Let me try that again. Thank you, Michelle Ramirez. Uh, very much appreciated and glad to see that all the work that's occurring in Latin America. Um, with that, um, who has also been in Latin America involved with uh, the Platinarius uh, plant in Honduras, as, uh, as well as many other things, we have with us uh, representing ORMAT, Josh Nordquest, who is ORMAT's Director of Resources. Josh oversees the um, performance and sustainability of the company's operating geothermal resources, predominantly in the U.S., uh, at least uh, he oversees the U.S. operations. That's, that's a better way to say that. With his 13-year tenure at ORMAT, um, he's also been involved in the global development of geothermal projects. And Josh, um, as, as a participant within our community here, also serves uh, beyond a board member of Geothermal Rising. He is a, uh, involved in the Nevada Commission of Mineral Resources, uh, previously the Geothermal Energy Association, Nevada Geothermal Council, and the Nevada New Energy Industry Task Force. Josh hails from uh, Potter County in Pennsylvania, and he has uh, bachelor's and master's degrees from, uh, in mechanical engineering from Rochester Institute of Technology, as well as University of California, Davis. Please welcome Josh Nordquist. Thank you. Guys, we need uh, Josh's um, point up and to share the screen, please. I cannot do that. You think you can do that, Josh? I have no idea. Okay. <laughs> so you had it. While we're doing that, um, just a couple of uh, brief announcements. Um, we are running a little late this morning, uh, so we will take a, uh, a coffee break here uh, before we go into the next panel. Uh, so uh, I think if everybody's happy with a 10, a 10 minute coffee break, uh, and uh, please uh, do come back in, the next panel's looking really good and, and looks like it will be an exciting, uh, exciting panel. So um, please come back and join us. The, um, the next thing is uh, really a plea to anybody who would uh, like to volunteer um, to help run these Zoom meetings. Um, uh, please, uh, please come up and see me or Vicky or any of the other staff. Uh, we do have volunteer slots open for Tuesday and Wednesday, so and we need we do need help. So thanks very much. All right, thanks, Will. Uh, for, actually, let's take a quick moment. I want to take a quick moment to recognize uh, Will, Brian, Vicky, and the rest of the team at Association Headquarters for really putting the back breaking work uh, around this event. Uh, there are a whole bunch of other volunteers that have been involved with it, but. Many of you would not believe the amount of work that goes into bringing this stuff together. And, uh, and, and they've been up tired, so I don't think Will has slept in two or three months now, Will. Uh, but uh, he's doing okay. Uh, so please, take a moment. Let's give everyone a, hand, a round of applause for helping out in this event. What, uh, 
what a trying time to bring something like this together too. Uh, absolutely unprecedented is a word that's the way we started using last year and uh, I think will be remembered for years to come. Uh, so to start out, my pronouns, I'm happy to say, are he, him, and his. This is the first time I've declared that, uh, but I'm happy and uh, proud to be making this change as, uh, as we are part of an evolving world. And uh, that's what it comes down to. Uh, generations to come are going are gonna to run the geothermal industry as we hopefully get to retire sometime. And, uh, and, and, and the industry needs to evolve with that. Uh, <clears throat> This is my 13th straight GRC conference. And while that's no record compared to other people in this room, I feel like I'm gaining ground. Uh, I'm happy to be here as a board member, to be able to give, some back, give back some of my time to the industry. And uh, I couldn't, couldn't be more proud of the, the time I've been able to put into that. All right, to get started, and we'll try to get through things a bit quickly to get back on time. I wanna do a quick introduction to ORMAT for those that, who in the room that may not know us very well. Uh, we have been in the geothermal industry for 56 years now. We've, uh, we currently own and operate just over 1,100 megawatts of geothermal, waste heat recovery, uh, solar, and energy storage around the world. And we remain committed to producing clean energy for generations to come. We're a unique company in that we've grown to be a vertically integrated geothermal company. What this means is that within our walls, we have the talent and the facilities to develop geothermal from greenfield and to operate for decades. And we couldn't be more proud of the people that we've assembled to get this task done. We're also very proud that we've been able to offer these services to clients around the world. We've installed capacities, uh, just over 3,200 megawatts of capacity worldwide for other companies and clientele uh, in our long history. But we wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for some very hard work and innovative thinking. And I like this slide because it, it shows how we've been able to produce growth in our industry throughout the roller coaster ride of, of everything we've experienced. Market changes, federal incentives, regulatory changes, and now a global pandemic. And all the time along this way, we've been uh, we've made changes in our thought process and our approach. So when when the the market was high and we were able to get PPAs very readily for great prices, we were developing new projects. When competition from solar came in, reduced energy prices across the board, we started expanding and optimizing our current projects. And all along the while, finding the opportune time to to move on acquisitions. Earlier this year, we announced the, the acquisition of both the Dixie Valley and, and Biowawi geothermal projects in Nevada. We couldn't be more happy and proud to see what we can do with these resources for, for generations to come. There's not a better time today for geothermal in the world. The ever-changing in growth and demand for clean energy sources, along with the, the world now being unable to ignore the impact of climate change has brought forth a significant chance for us to grow. But this is not, uh, it's not going to be easy. I'll say that off the bat, without a growing workforce at the same time. Uh, we are a, uh, we're, I'll say a small industry, but the interest is coming in leaps and bounds. I couldn't be more happy about that. We're getting interest today from oil and gas companies that uh, hopefully in the coming years will take a, a large stance inside our industry and start accelerating the growth as well. Uh, it takes a village to raise a child. I have three. It takes a whole city as far as I can tell. But this will hold true as we uh, move forward. Uh, actually, there's other studies out there that show the, the growth coming as well. And, and I know these are studies. I'm not going to say that the, they're the Bible by any means. But uh, many organizations today are projecting significant growth on the level of gigawatts per year in the coming years. Uh, I know I would be dishonest in saying that developing a gigawatt over in 10 years for us alone is a, is, is a huge task. But I couldn't be more anxious to try to get there. And knowing that as industry, us industry as a team, we've been able to make strides in this already. And, and we'll, we'll touch on that a little bit. 
I'm going to skip this one and move forward. We couldn't be more prepared as well. If we look back on our long history, we have developed resources of all shapes and sizes and temperatures, and we've developed projects uh, from one megawatt to hundreds of megawatts. On an infrastructure side, we have all the tools we need right now. There are new tools to come, but we, are, we have the ability to get to that spot. One item that doesn't get center stage that I wanted to bring up today is, is the artificial lift. Many of you have heard that term, I'm sure, but never have heard it in the plenary session. And there's a reason for that. I think uh, I see a future here as we develop lower temperature resources and as our existing steam fields mature, we need to use these technologies in our systems and new projects coming online in the future will be dependent upon them. And I think I'm happy to announce uh, that there's been significant advancements in this technology in the last few years and are on the floor today for you to see. Uh, it's a subject very near and dear to my heart. It's what I deal with on a, on a daily basis. And uh, you know, beyond the complexity that it has allowed me to understand over the last few years, it has realized a huge appreciation for the dependency on uh, these little systems. So today, ORMATS, uh, out of ORMATS production wells, almost or just over 70% of them are pumped. When we look to the future of the products we're going to develop, we are focused on artificial lift being the delivery method to bring our fuel to our power plants. So what does this mean today? Uh, we've been watching this industry very closely and I want to take a chance to recognize some significant advancements, not in detail, but I'll allow you guys to go find them. Uh, a few companies that are here today. So uh, out there, Baker Hughes, Schlumberger, and even Ormat have made significant advancements and moves in the world of that artificial lift that are going to bring on new resources and drive optimization of new projects in the future. So I, uh, I only I plant that seed so you can go and ask questions and figure it out for yourself. We also have a session uh, on Tuesday morning at nine o'clock uh, regarding the subject as well. Now I can't leave this stage today without bringing this up one more time. Uh, we brought it up again, but uh, I want to spend another minute on it. The decision this year by the CPUC here in California to focus on grid reliability and require this 1,000 megawatts of base load energy, clean energy to come online is the single most significant market change we've had in the last decade. The last one we had was the evolution of the PTC and ITC. This was back in the 2006 and 2008 timeframe. This is what we need to be working towards, especially here, I focus on the US, working towards with 100% of our effort today. And geothermal is the primary solution, as long as we can produce it. Remember that uh, uh, the California is, is uh, I think I say this and I'm, I'm pretty sure it's close by, but is the single largest renewable energy market in the world today. And they're moving quick, they're moving quicker than I think uh, we can pace at our current stage. So I say that because the future is bright and we have to run into the tunnel and run towards the light as fast as possible. All right, lastly, I wanna share some of the most beautiful pictures that we have today. And that is a project coming together. This has been uh, the culmination of, of well over a decade of work in our company, but probably is involved by one way, shape or form, a large percentage of people in this room uh, the, uh, the CD4 project just outside of Mammoth Lakes is in the final stages of development and constructions. So here is a picture of uh, one of Ormat's drilling rigs finishing one of the, the numerous in production and injection wells on site, uh, as David mentioned earlier, and his Kenai team is, help, is helping us out there as well. And this is the best time in a geothermal project when we have such activity going on on site, things are coming together and the finish line is right in front of us. The power plant is also coming together in its final stages of completion. 
as, uh, as indicated here, that's going to be a 30 megawatts of capacity. It uh, has a huge amount of economic impact and local job production. And the power will be supplied to a multitude of, uh, of uh, utilities in California. SCAPA being one of the largest utilities, if not the largest single utility in California or power authority. And two CCAs, Community Choice Aggregators, Silicon Valley Clean Energy and Monterey Bay Community Power. This also is a great example of how the market is changing. This is a single project, it's 30 megawatts. It's, it's, a, it's a small amount of power compared to what's, what's uh, being consumed in California. But even that is getting the interest of different organizations. It's not big utilities, it's a, it's a mix of everyone. And this is, how, this is how contracts are going to look in the future as well. Uh, they're, they can be done. It's a matter of outreach. It's a matter of working hard to bring the industry together. And I, uh, I failed to mention earlier, but one of the things I wanted to note about the CPU decision, CPUC decision is the impact this industry has had on that. We've spent years as a team working with regulators, informing and educating them on the industry, on the, the, the reliability and the value of geothermal. And that, that now producing fruit this year is just extremely exciting. So to wrap up, one clean and clear message. We're busy and we are hiring. We couldn't be more happy than that. And uh, again, I couldn't be more happy to be here today. We have a, we have a small team from Ormat here during the conference this year, but uh, we have a larger team online and an even larger team next year as we always have. Uh, so we wish you the best here. I can't wait to speak to any of you on the conference floor and uh, thank you. And now we can get up out of our seats and go to, go to the next meeting. <laughs> Unless there's any more announcements, of course. Thank you. I, I think Josh said it all on that. Uh, much appreciated all the speakers, your attendance, participation. Please remember on Wednesday, we've got a members meeting lunch and we'll also be issuing the, uh, the awards for um, special achievements during that period. Um, so... Thank you. Enjoy the conference. Be safe, be inclusive, and be welcoming. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, everybody. Um, John, could you unshare the screen, please? We did have, and I apologize to everybody on the, um, uh, on the webinar, we did have a, an audio issue with the um, Feel Good Factor video that we played earlier on. So we're going to play it again here now uh, and uh, get it uh, streamed out to the webinar folks with sound. Our geothermal technologies office has been investing in developing and deploying geothermal for decades. And we've asked Congress for 57 million more dollars for this program in the upcoming year. This is the Allen S. King coal-fired power station. It produces 600 megawatts of steady, reliable baseload power. Shutting down this power station is the right thing to do as we've got to stop burning fossil fuels and save our earth. The problem is, we can't replace this power with just wind and solar. In California, the Public Utilities Commission has finally and formally recognized this problem and has now called for 1,100 megawatts of firm and renewable 24-7 electricity generation by 2026. That's geothermal energy. We're learning 
from both uh, successes at the state level, like last year's California Public Utilities Commission procurement decision that geothermal rising helped to boost. And we're learning from our international work, obviously like Europe's progress on district heating systems. In April, we announced $15 million for geothermal research projects in West Virginia as part of our investments in job creation and economic opportunities in the hard hit coal and power plant communities area. WVU Morganton campus has been identified as a priority location for deep direct use geothermal project. Therefore, to perform a geothermal resource quantification and risk assessment, an exploratory well will be drilled by a depth of 15,000 feet, along with a full logging and towing program. We'll be using state-of-the-art te drilling technologies for this exploratory well. The project will have implications beyond West Virginia University campus. It will provide data for geothermal resources for other potential sites in the middle Appalachian Basin that has similar geology and demonstrate geothermal energy is a national resource but not limited to Western states. Department of Energy sees geothermal as a crucial tool to help us tackle the climate crisis, to deliver 40% of the benefits of clean energy to disadvantaged communities, and to build a skilled, diverse energy workforce. The newly formed Diversity, Equity, and Inclusion Task Force has been very busy since we formed seven months ago. Our first goal was to create a DEI statement that shows Geothermal Rising's commitment to improving diversity, equity, and inclusion across the geothermal community. Geothermal Rising is committed to improving diversity, equity, and inclusion to provide a brighter future for Earth and all its inhabitants. Our organization and community embrace and celebrate our members' differences. It is a responsibility of Geothermal Rising to encourage and promote diversity, equity, and inclusion. As a global geothermal nonprofit organization, we are committed to connecting the geothermal community. There is more work to be done, and as we expand across markets and internationally, Geothermal Rising will continue to seek equitable improvement to elevate the geothermal community. The infrastructure investments that are in President Biden's Build Back Better agenda are going to turbocharge geothermal energy in America. We're talking about the biggest investment in clean energy and transmission in history. So my message to you is this. When it comes to geothermal, America is open for business. We are so ready to partner with you to get this done. We are grateful for your tireless work to elevate this important, clean and reliable energy source. And we're grateful for your willingness to train the next generation of geothermal professionals. And we are excited to secure policy wins all across the country. So thank you so much for inviting me to participate. I hope you have a fantastic conference.